When you can anchor yourself to what you do want and start to look for evidence that it could be true, that's a game changer. Welcome to the Sharing Passion and Purpose podcast, a weekly podcast providing career and creative inspiration to help you build a purpose-filled life. If you're interested in tapping into your creative potential, pursuing a career with passion, and building on your biggest and best resource, yourself, please join me on this path. I'm your host, Nancy Moore, and I want you to know that I'm on this journey with you. So let's get started. Before we jump into this episode, I'd like to take a minute to let you know about my upcoming live events for women called Conversations with Passion and Purpose. The live events are meant for women and they'll include entrepreneurs, change makers, young professionals, and college age women in an opportunity for them to come together in a space that will inspire, uplift, and generate community while promoting networking and support through connections in a small group atmosphere. The event coming up is actually sold out, but to learn about future and upcoming events, make sure that you are following me on social media, sharing passion and purpose on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and at passion sharing on Twitter. I will also be sending out emails. So if you want to go to sharing passion and purpose.com and sign up for Nancy's nudge of encouragement. That is a way that I connect with the community and send out positivity. And also it will keep you in the loop of upcoming events. So I hope that you join me there as well. Now, here's the episode. Tracy Spears has made a career out of helping others. As the founder of the Exceptional Leaders Lab, she engages with developing leaders, inspiring teamwork, and creating inclusive cultures. She's a best-selling author, host of the Shift Out Loud podcast, TEDx speaker, you should look her up, and keynote speaker, among many other things. During this podcast, we'll discuss her humble beginnings growing up in a trailer park in Tulsa, as well as being disowned by her parents in her early 20s when they found out she was gay, and how all of these life experiences have shaped her into who she is today. She's a cheerleader to those who don't want to play small and want to shift out loud. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Tracy Spears. I am honored to have you with me on my podcast. How are you? I'm good. I'm honored to be invited. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We do have a a mutual friend in common. You saw a picture of Dr. Meg Myers Morgan here. And so we connected about her. She is a phenomenal individual. Uh, But I have been hearing the same about you. So listen, that's super kind. I I think she's one of the most amazing women I've ever met. And I learn from her every time I'm in her presence. So, yeah, I'm just, I was thrilled to see that you all have connected. Yeah, well, likewise. Okay, so you grew up in Tulsa. I did. And, uh, which is really cool. And uh, your upbringing, I would think, would be uh, just kind of a normal upbringing, but it, it, was it? It, <laughs> it was a little different. And you actually have a TED talk where you talk about it. Um, but if you'll share a little bit about how you grew up in Tulsa and kind of how that shaped you to who you are now. Uh, yeah, I did. I guess I did. Uh, I uh, born and raised, spent my whole life here and grew up in uh, a trailer park. I lived at I always tell the address, 848 North 91st East Place, which is a trailer park that you see when you exit to go to the airport, uh, which is symbolic to me because I travel all over the world and I never leave Tulsa without going by that. It was the last row of the trailer park and just being grounded and grateful and remembering, you know, from where it started. So, yeah, I had a I had a really interesting childhood in that sense. But you don't you never know when you're a kid right? You you don't know what's happening. You're just like, everybody lives in a trailer or everybody, this is what everybody goes through. So in the rear view, I look back and I'm so grateful Mm -hmm. for all of the lessons and all the things that happened. Um, I assume you feel the same way about, you know, the way you grew up though, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, but to have an appreciation later too, 
is important, yes. you know, because you are the sum of everything, you know, the, the way that you grew up, how you were raised. Um, that's, that's you. So one of the things that has struck me because this is our first time meeting in person, but I have listened to the podcast. I've, you know, gotten into your social media and you are such a natural optimist to me. And so I'm just wondering if, if that's true, if you are a natural optimist, if that comes easily to you. How would I answer that? Yeah. I wouldn't say I'm a natural optimist. I'm a learned optimist. Okay. For sure. Okay. Um, and I think I learned that. I had this front row seat to two parents where my dad was, you can be anything and do anything. And my mom was not. <laughs> so, okay. So I had this experience of what am I going to choose? So I feel that over the years, um, watching my mom, and amazing in her own right, lots of way too much many layers to talk about today but Mm -hmm. I watched her not be an optimist like chose the negative route every time and most every time Mm -hmm. and so for me I just watched the energy of that and sometimes you learn what you don't want to be Mm -hmm. so I think I learned from that that man this doesn't feel good this is not does not align with, you know, where I want to go and the things that I want to do. So I think from from that point, it started there. But I also just have had a lot of experience where I think I'm pretty resilient. Um, and you know the best way to build resilience is to go through a bunch of shit. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so having uh, done that, I think every time you overcome something, that muscle that says, okay, this is temporary, it gets bigger, right? This The muscle that says... It, this isn't going to define me. I have some choice. I have some agency in this. I think that has come from a lot of adversity. So I don't know how she would learn that. So I think the optimism comes from I've been here or I've been in a worse place and it can it can turn out better. And so then I think you just kind of integrate that in how you move about the world. Mm-hmm. And I think life is better when you are more positive and you, you know, can can look at the glass half full. And it isn't natural for everybody. It just appears to me that it is natural for you. So thank thank you you for sharing that it's more learned for you. And that's a choosing. It is a choice. I like, you know, I do remember I'm a, I'm a product of all of those motivational books, Zig Ziglar. He's my favorite. He He still is. Yeah. I love him. I mean, he was timeless, timeless. Yeah. you know, the strangest secret and the think and grow riches and all those. Like I remember when I first was introduced to those and there was a part of me that was like, wow, I can't even wrap my mind around the idea that I do have so much agency. And yet I look back and go, that influenced how I think. And that really gave me so much hope. So I think those early influences really have helped. And I want to say this, when somebody is just a born optimist, I get suspicious because I sometimes people don't think of, I need to know it's half full and half empty. You know what I mean? Like I need to know both sides of that because that's going to inform me differently. It's going to, I'm not going to have, I'm not going to miss some things. You know what I'm saying? Like if, if I was like, oh, it'll be just fine, it'll, then I might not pay enough attention to, but there's a couple of things I need to make sure that I navigate, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so I think being able to see both of those is, has been beneficial for me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, good perspective. So I have a friend, uh, Amy Siegfried, okay. who knew you were coming on the podcast and had this great analogy that she shared with me. Oh, okay. And so it's when you spoke to Leadership Oklahoma. I don't know how many times you've spoken to that group, probably you know several, but she was in the group that you spoke to. And okay. she mentioned an analogy with a kaleidoscope. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what it is, she said that when you, and then it stuck with her. So it's funny, but this. anyway, but when you see something different and you have a different perspective, that kind of creates more and a different color, a different shade in your vision and it expands your kaleidoscope. And she that. said, you cannot unsee it once you've seen it. It's mm-hmm. part of you. Mm. And so based on your experiences and and where you are at this point, I want you to share about your kaleidoscope. Hmm. 
So is the question like, you know, what am I seeing because of the experience? Yes. Tell me, it is, it's interesting. I'm in this space right now um, where I'm seeing um, that not doing is more valuable for me than, to, than the hustle. This is different for me. Like I'm, I am, I live in the hustle and have always lived in the hustle that, you know, you eat what you kill. Like I was a full commission salesperson, uh, worked in a company for 29 years that, you know, I was bonused on production. So I I never had a salary. And so I'm now, and maybe because I just had a knee replacement, I'm, you know, sitting still and really contemplating that, you know, there's a cost to that when you don't slow down when you don't inventory when you don't learn the lesson and I feel like it's it's made um, some of the things I've repeated some mistakes and when you don't take the time to inventory that so my kaleidoscope is where did I do those things before and I know how that turns out I got to make a different choice and also what are the things that I want to continue and build on and play bigger in so I'm I'm in an interesting time right now, probably age in the knee, where I'm I'm starting to be a little bit more selective. Um, Meg Myers Morgan, I love that you or that you talked about her. It's like she she had she said something to me. I said it on my podcast. I'll say it on yours because mm-hmm. if you haven't listened to this or you haven't heard this before, maybe it'll change you. Um, and it is, you know, we're having this conversation, and she said, and she did did a talk where she talked about how the lighthouse doesn't chase the boats. And when I heard it, it was like a lightning bolt because I have spent a lot of my life chasing the boats. And her comment to me was, you know, sometimes, Tracy, the power's in standing still and you're not going to save all the boats. But, you know, so, so I think that's where I'm at right now. Embrace that a little bit more to not spend so much energy chasing things that probably aren't in my best use, best good anyway, right? Well, I like that perspective. I was just talking to a friend yesterday about being reflective and introspective. And she is going through a year where she's not saying yes to any big projects. Mm. And she's really being more still and reflective and figuring out what she wants the rest of her life to look like. I would love to know how that has changed her. I hope you have her, whoever she is on your podcast. Yeah, she's been on my podcast. And then I probably, she's actually going to be the person at my conversations with passion and purpose. Nice. Who is it? It's uh, Cindy Kane. Okay. Nice. So yeah, she's, she's incredible. I'll, I'll share that book with you after, but she's written a cookbook, but it's interesting because we were talking about just in preparation for this live event the uh, topic and questions. And so I wanted to get an idea of where she was coming from. And the questions that I was thinking about are going to shift based on her feeling and where she is right now. Sure. Don't you think that so many people move about the world saying yes and trying to please everybody else? And you do get to this age where you think, wait a minute, I don't, I don't want to do that mm-hmm. <laughs> anymore. Mm-hmm. And why does it take so long, right? Like if I could go back to my younger self, I would say, you know, that that piece of it is so exhausting. Save yourself uh, on that. Uh, but yeah, it's nice to finally be there. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> You've arrived. <laughs> so you mentioned playing bigger. And I wanted to visit with you about that because that's one of your common threads is about playing bigger. And so I am wondering how people play small because I, I think in your through your consulting and through working with people, you hear a lot of different perspectives. So if you could share some examples of how people play small and then also ways, maybe a couple of ways to overcome those limiting beliefs? Mm. Well, the first one, so ways people play small. Uh, You know, I think people play small when they're on autopilot. I think when people don't investigate their own thoughts, when people don't become super intentional, I'm, I'm I'm super intentional. Like I think about 
what do I want? I sat in the car before I walked in. What do I want in this exchange? Before I respond to a text, what do I want? Before I respond to an email? Like that interruption is, um, it serves me. Because if I'm on autopilot, I'm going to make so many, I'm going to make more mistakes and I'm, you know, I need to be even more intentional. Some people are listening and go, she's, you mean that was her intention? <laughs> but I do really think about that. I think people play small by not changing their mind. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of people that they hear something when they're a kid or they hear something, you know, maybe on on TV. I don't want this to be political or anyway. Yeah. That's not what I'm saying. But I think that some people need to think for themselves, right? Like if you've adopted somebody else's doctrine or if you aren't saying, wait a minute, how does that feel to me? That's playing small. Um, not taking risks is playing small, right? Um, you know, thinking about, oh, if you ever think, I could never do that, you're playing small. Like, you know, you're, that decision that you could never do that is now true. It is, it is your truth. So to surround yourself with people that say, hey, wait a minute, I don't think that's true, is incredibly important. You know, that's the second part of your question, and I'll answer that in, in a little bit. But I think just, you know, thinking differently about all of those things that you are um, limiting yourself. So you said the self-limiting beliefs. I think that's true. And I, and I think that the second part of your question I'll answer with this is I have this amazing network of people, ecosystem, that challenge me all of the time. And I hope to be that for people that are in my orbit. You know, somebody will go, oh, you know, I'm not... I'm probably not good enough about that. And I will say, I see that differently. I don't think you're right. I don't think that's true. Like to have people that will interrupt that thought pattern is one strategy to help you play bigger. I think the other thing that I watch people do, and it's probably one of my pet peeves. Do you ever read Vanity Fair? Mm-mm. You know, well, it's been years. Okay, there's a, at the end of it, they always ask the question, what's the one quality you deplore in other people? And in mine is people that are judgmental. I think you play small when you start judging other people because when you're judging other people, what I know to be true in my bones is it, you are really talking about yourself. And so, like, when people are judging other people, I always go, oh, that's interesting. That, that informs me about how you feel about yourself. So I observe that. I don't, I, sometimes I don't say anything because some people are so connected to their beliefs that, you know, you know they're not going to change their minds. But I think that's another way. Um, I think not spending a lot of time in, in gratitude, that's how you can play small. Like, if you're not paying attention to the things that are going well, you're not inviting those things into the future. So if you're only paying attention to the things that that don't bring you joy, I mean, I think we know this universally, that's what you're going to get. So uh, I'll, I'll try this out on you. I, I want to do this, you know, whether it's a talk or whatever it ends up being, that you're at the end of your life, doesn't matter what you believe religiously, spiritually, but somebody says to you, uh, you know, listen, Nancy, I gave you everything that you thought about with any frequency. And you sit there and go, you mean everything I thought about? Yeah, like there was no good or bad, right or wrong, everything you thought about. And I think the idea that you would go, oh my gosh, I thought more about what I didn't want than what I did want. That shift can make you play bigger. That shift to say, not thinking about what I don't want, but what do I want? And when you can anchor yourself to what you do want and start to look for evidence that it could be true, that's a game changer. And that's what I hope that I do for people in my work. Okay. I love that. And it was just recently I found that out about people who are judgmental. That is so reflective of definitely themselves. Yes. Themselves. No question. There's no question. And when you know that, you move about those conversations differently. Right. Right. Like I, I had a, a therapist one time that said, whatever you defend, you make real. And I can't get that out of my head. And it's true. Like when people start defending something, you're like, oh, you're making that real. This is real. This is real for you. Right. Or, or mm-hmm. when what people judge is more about, you know, who they are. So, yeah, it's interesting. Mm-hmm. You have a whole different energy with that knowledge, I think, as you enter some of those conversations. Mm-hmm. It's also a little freeing. Because that's totally them. That's all about them. That's right. You know, and again, you you don't have to concern yourself with, you know, what they're thinking about you. Because again, that that is reflective of them. That's right. That's right. You can say, I see that differently. 
and win the, and win that conversation. You don't have to defend yourself. You just have to say, gosh, I see that. That's not my experience. I see that differently. And I don't know, you leave, I think, with the same energy that you came in instead of, you know, that when you get kind of spun up, when mm-hmm. you feel like, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. I've got to defend myself or I've got to, yeah, that's, there. there's no value in that, none. Mm-hmm. So, okay, let me ask you about this because this came up yesterday in my class uh, with my students and somebody was talking about imposter syndrome mm-hmm. and I hadn't ever addressed it and I thought it was interesting because it was they were doing some presentations and um, so one of the people that my students had interviewed was talking about you know not worrying about imposter syndrome and there had been there were students in my class that were not familiar with that terminology and I'm very familiar yeah, <laughs> with that of course we are. so yeah so uh, I wanted you to speak to that imposter syndrome because I feel like at any level I think you're seeing people at a very high level you're seeing people at different levels but even at such a high level i believe people struggle with imposter syndrome and so i i wanted to get your perspective on that and then how you maybe coach people through that yes and uh i have it everyone has it and the more self-awareness you have Mm -hmm. the more imposter syndrome you have so i like it when somebody has that i don't like it when it keeps them playing small but you should have imposter syndrome when you're doing something you've never done before, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? There's there's some value in that. Like that's, you know, if if you were to take on a new job or and you that you've never done before, and you were to go in there like I got this, this is no big deal. You're gonna have you're gonna miss so many things because you're overly confident in that. So to be in that space where you're like, wait a minute, I've never done this. It creates a self awareness that informs you. That, but the the problem is that people don't learn the lessons and integrate, hey, wait a minute, I'm pretty good at this now. And you move through the imposter syndrome. You've got to get to the other side of it. Mm-hmm. But you get to the other side of it and you go, okay, wait a minute, I do what I know what I'm doing. And I'm not going to shrink when, I'm, when I walk into rooms. But you're going to have it again when you get the next promotion. So like to me, I'm, I'm okay with imposter syndrome as a tool for self-awareness as a way to say, okay, there are things I need to learn. It keeps me humble. It keeps me learning. But when someone doesn't integrate the growth into their self-view, that's when it's really difficult. Like if you if you don't see the progress that you've made, if you don't see, hey, wait a minute, I now have a body of knowledge and I should be able to garner a certain level of respect if you don't step into that that actually ends up backfiring on you so that's that's what I would say and I would say this this is what I know when I'm in imposter syndrome and I am you know the evidence doesn't match the feeling what I know is I'm way too self-focused I'm way I'm thinking way too much about myself in that moment so that's always my advice like when you're having your most imposter syndrome and it's not true right like if Mm -hmm. you're now, wait a minute, I've done this a thousand times. I know what I'm doing, but I still don't feel good about it. I'm thinking about me. And some people, is that self-centered? I'm, I don't know the difference between the two. My definition in self-focused is I'm thinking about me instead of you. And that doesn't make me valuable for anyone, right? Like I need to be thinking about you. I need to think about the audience. I need to think about who's in front of me. So that's just, I always know, oh, you know, I'm the messenger or I am, you know, my goal in this conversation is to help you. It's not to think about myself. So that's probably one of the things that I think about often. Like, oh, wait a minute. Why am I thinking about myself here? This isn't about me. This is about, this is about who we're talking to in this podcast, right? This is about who's listening. This isn't about me and you. This is, Mm -hmm. we're hoping somebody changes their mind about something because of something that they heard. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I love that. Um, Okay, so, and this might be a little different just based on uh, your perspective, but what motivates you? Fear. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I use fear. Like, I use fear as fuel. Like, I don't ever want to be irrelevant, or I don't want to be thinking about something um, that is 20 years old in the way you think about it. So like, I want to be, I want to be relevant. I want to be helpful. What really motivates me is 
helping other people. That's why I do what I do. Um, it, you know, if I, I am a messenger, and for me to be a really good messenger, I have to continue to to learn and grow myself. I have to continue to to you know read. I have to continue to engage, um, and I also have to keep. One of the things that's happening for me, I'll go back to that kaleidoscope, is I'm realizing I've spent most of my adult life not talking about me, but talking about, you know, some of the lessons, other people. And and so I'm getting more in touch with my story being part of that in a bigger way. So part of that comes from, uh, you know, being disowned from my family when they found out I was gay in my, you know, early 20s. So, you know, I I spent a lot of my... um, my adulthood not answering intimate questions and I'm trying to change that a bit. I'm scared about that by the way. Political the political climate right now has made that a little bit scarier. Um, this is probably not at all where you wanted me to go with this question. Um, but I think, you know, that's also, you know, kind of making me up my game a bit. That's motivating me. So, you know, I can't imagine if I don't keep moving forward and thinking a little bit bigger that I'm, you know, I'm going to be letting people down, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and that, this is why I do the podcast, because I think it's just interesting to hear different people's perspectives, you know, and background, and people will, you know, align or, you know, your story is going to resonate with somebody who's listening. Yeah. Well, and and sadly, somebody's just turned this off because of that that piece of the podcast. I know, but like I do worry about that. Like it's, I don't. it is. Mm-hmm. I thank you for not. Uh, mm-hmm. I always get you know my voice is a little tighter when I even start talking about it. That's just also growing up in Oklahoma. You know, mm-hmm. that's. Uh, but we were in this amazing part in you know in the city of Tulsa where I feel so safe and seen. And, you know, included, it's been, it's also been just a huge surprise, and that's why I still live here. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that personal side of it, too. When I ask these questions, I never know where it's going to go, and I love when people open up that much, so I appreciate that. My thought with that is, because I know, you know, you kind of mentioned at the beginning of the podcast about your uh, background with sales, and it was 100% commission, and so what motivated you then I think if I would have asked you when you were 25 or 30 would have been a lot different than where you are now. And I think it's just the timing, you know, the reflection. For sure. Listen, you know, when you have no plan B, like, you know, my, when your parents disown you, I have no siblings, no, there was nobody that was going to loan me 500 bucks. I've never had a safety net in that way. And so, I mean, that makes you hustle, right? Mm-hmm. Like when I think about, you know, how much easier it would have been if I, you know, somebody would have said, hey, listen, you know, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll help you pay your rent. I mean, I've had, I've had my like, electricity turned off. I've had credit cards and I, I, when I was in my early 20s, it was, it was such a grind. But I learned so much about money and investing and saving. And I learned so much about, uh, you know, relying on myself. So I... I wouldn't trade any of it. You know, I look back on it and laugh about it, but I wouldn't trade any of that. But you're right. Like, I'm not worrying about paying the electricity anymore. Um, But I am worrying about, you know, the people that are, that are the the younger generation. Like, are we being good stewards of, you know, letting them understand some of those challenges? Because I'm, I'm watching us repeat some of these mistakes that generations have made. And, that really worries me. Uh, it really worries me. Well, then, if you if you wouldn't trade any of that, is there a, a point in your life where something happened where you would love to have a do over? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, gosh, I mean, there's so many. I can't even oh. imagine. Like I can't. <laughs> even, I can't even imagine somebody going, oh. "Nope, I nailed it every time." Like no. But there's one, there is one, though, that immediately came to mind when you said that. I um, I would have been a college softball coach. That's probably, so I played softball in college. And when I got out of college, um, meaning my eligibility was up, I didn't actually graduate on time, um, I was 
offered a like a graduate assistant at Sam Houston and a and to be an assistant at UNLV. And I got in the car and I drove down to Sam Houston. I'm like, this is it. I'm going to be a college softball coach. And the they brought me into this room, uh, and it was it was really it was really eye opening. And they said, okay, so the job pays four thousand dollars a year, but you get to live in the dorm with all of the college kids, and you get to work um, at the uh, sporting goods store whenever you're not you know whenever your team's not playing. And I was like. What? You get to. <laughs> I know. Like, I'm doing this for more than that. So I got in my car, I left, and then UNLV, I ran, I was playing in Japan, and uh, the coach, we were, you know, it doesn't matter, but we were talking, and she's like, we should come to UNLV. And I'm like, before I do, like, what kind of, you know, what kind, what does it pay? She goes, oh, we pay $11,000. And I was like, man, so I, so I get it, like, it was a passion of mine, and I totally, you know, when you, I can't live on $11,000 a year at the time. I probably could have, by the way. But yeah, so I'd go back and maybe, maybe do that a little bit differently. And of course I get to say that, I, you know, as a graduate of OU and watching the OU softball team and Patty Gass was just crushing it and making so much money. I do look back and go, man, I would have been no Patty Gasso for sure. Uh, but, you know, just the idea that it's come so far that you can make you know a living being a college softball coach that would be one that was a long answer uh oh my gosh but there's i don't know so many more how about you what's your what's your big regret what would you go dang okay i wondered if you were going to turn this around i'm trying not to but (laughs) no i I, i'm so it's hard because i would say being an accounting major but that is also what one thing that has helped propel me into helping people maybe step into what they're passionate about because I pursued something in college that would make money. I didn't want to rely on anybody else. I wanted to be able to stand on my own two feet, make my own money, do well. I knew it was a guaranteed job. That's right. So it was like a cop out. Interesting. I didn't go into what I would have been passionate and good in really thinking about where I would be best suited, where I'd be good. Did but you, I was, it was fear. It was really just, I was so fearful that I couldn't find a job. So you chose the that because you knew you'd always have a job. Did you have the idea that the minute you got out of college, you had to get in a job and stay in that job forever? Not necessarily. Like I would take in the job, take in the security, and I did this and stayed you know, for forever. So I love that you knew at an early age what you didn't want. I love that. Well, looking back, you know, that hindsight yeah. being twenty twenty, but... But you made the change in a year. <sighs> that would have taken me 10, 20 years, I think. Yeah. Because well, ne- how I felt never mattered to me. Like, when I, when I was looking for security. Like, I was like, well, you know, e- even though I'm saying to you it was full commission, yeah. that somebody, that when they recruited me to this job... The, they said, you know, there's nothing more secure than working for yourself. And, like, I'm a mantra person, and when, like, I got that in my head, I was like, that's the way the world is. I'm the only person I can rely on. So, of course, I would stay, right? Mm-hmm. Like, okay. But, yeah, I don't, I, I, yeah, for you, though. But we didn't have, you know, based on your production or anything, there was not a bonus. So you probably, with your 100% commission, were seeing you know, great results. And you're working for, I want to say you're working for the man, like you're, you're bringing that in for this company, but you're still, you know, it's, it's lucrative enough for you to be, I would say able to, you know, I see stick that, that out. I see that a little bit differently. Okay. I, I was, Oh, I, now you're I, saying, okay. I was so bad in okay. the, for the first three years to like, I, uh, I don't, I can't even tell you why I stayed other than, the people that I worked with, I loved. Like it was this job that once a year you would be flown to the corporate office in, in San Francisco, in Roner Park, California, and you would meet all the other people that joined when you joined. And so there was something about, you know, somebody one time said, you know, the harder it is, uh, the more people that quit, the more this is, I know this is for me. And I bought all of that stuff. I was like, that's right. So I, so when most people were quitting because they should have, because they couldn't afford, you know, food, uh, I was like, yeah, this is this is why I'm going to stay. Like, I just reversed that. 
And you said, I'm, 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 I'm optimist. I look back on that now and go, that was pretty optimistic. Um, but there was a turning point, but it took years for me. I can't even tell you how many years. I don't even want to, to be able to go, okay, I'm, I'm going to make a living here. Like, I mean, it was probably four or five years before I thought, okay, I, I can do this. And I can remember sitting there going, if I just had, you know, X amount of money in savings, if I just had, you know, because I had nothing. Uh, but again, I wouldn't trade any of it. For sure. I love that you appreciate your experiences ah. along the way. Because you said that a few times. You wouldn't trade any of it. And I mean, that you can't. You, you can't. So there That's you true. go. Yeah. So what are you most proud of then in your career at this point? I'm most proud of... That's an interesting question. I've written a couple of books. Of course, that's going to be on the list. Um, I have some amazing friends. I'm super proud of that. Um, proud that I haven't, I've actually gotten more curious, right? That I'm, I, I'm more at, at my age, I'm more interested in um, getting better and growing and learning than I even was in college. Like I hated the whole idea of going to class and my, my grades reflected that. But I, I love that I've been able to appreciate everything that's happened and not fe- you know not be jaded by it like you meet people and you're like man they are a rain cloud you're like you you know you can change this at any time so i'm glad that i've been able to learn all of that um yeah that's probably and i have an a, I, listen our company is we have so many amazing clients and so many amazing partnerships and i mean i i say thank you uh, all the time, often over that. So I'm super grateful about the relationships that I've been able to build. And in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? Like, you know, when the pandemic hit, we became an online leadership company immediately. And I was on a plane every week. And when that when that happened, we were able to pivot. And I had enough um, contacts in Tulsa to be able to you know, leverage a really great business here in Tulsa. And that's been such a, I'm so, so grateful for that. Because, you know, and the definition of an expert is somebody from out of town. So I would like, <laughs> you know, I would go to all these other cities and people would be like, oh, this is you. But in Tulsa, I was like, you know, nothing. And uh, so I, I'm glad that's turned around. So that's been nice too. So, yeah. So, okay, you mentioned your business. So tell us about what you offer with the Exceptional Leaders Lab. Thank you. Um, so so we are a leadership training company, and we offer executive coaching for leaders at all levels. Um, we offer online leadership courses. Um, I do a lot of keynoting, so I, I do get, I have this super cool job. I do a, a lot of women in leadership um, as well. I, um, you know, we do a lot of writing. Um, we do... You know, if you follow us on LinkedIn, there's, you know, we're always trying to, to give you new information for whatever's happening in today's time. So, yeah, we do a lot of, you know, any kind of business consulting. And I, you know, I love that. Uh, and we're, you know, we're continuing to create new content. So, you know, the, you know, work environment has definitely changed. So we've had to evolve. And Wally Schmader, who's my business partner, who is... Bernie Toppin and I'm Elton John, for those of you that are old enough to know, know what, what that'll mean. So he loves to do research and, you know, he's up at three or four o'clock every morning, you know, thinking, reading and doing all the research that informs our work. So I'm so grateful for his partnership. He's, he, he and I have been friends for, I don't know, 35, 36 years. That, that job that I had, by the way, for 29 years, he and I worked together. Uh, he was actually my boss for a little while. So He's my now business partner and, and amazing. And, you know, he's everything I'm not and likewise. I think you have an appreciation for each other just because I've heard you on the podcast. Oh, yeah. You know, and so anyway, and I like that synergy or that energy that you have with each other. And I feel like you complement each other in a lot of ways. So. Thank you. We do. And the fact that we've been able to recognize that um, has been the joy because... You know, sometimes when people see things very differently, it can create conflict, and we've never let that. Well, I'm not gonna. That's a lie. We do, we definitely conflict, but we always know we'll get to the other side of it. We always know that 
you know, we're, we're not, we're not going to break our, our partnership up because we see things differently, but we're both able to take what each other's saying and integrate that into our view. So it's, it's nice to have another partner that can do that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, very cool. Okay, so in wrapping up, my theme for this year is growing more in 2024. So I'm wondering how you are growing either personally or professionally this year. For me, growing is doing more of what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, it is to keep learning. It is to, you know, I think get more aligned with what brings me joy. So for me, growth is actually not doing some things. So I flip that around a little bit. Um, I'm really trying to do the Meg Myers Morgan. I'm trying to be more of the lighthouse and quit chasing all the boats. So for me, growth is to be more aligned with what brings me energy. What am I supposed to be doing? What, you know, how can I be uh, the best support to my clients? So some people would hear the growth question and say, I got to do more. My growth is that I'm trying to do more by doing less. So that, that would be my answer. Okay, well, I love that. I love that very much. Um, well, thank you so much for visiting today. And um, it's just been a lot of fun getting to know you better and appreciate your time today. Likewise. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap on this week's episode. I want to thank you for listening to the Sharing Passion and Purpose podcast. It means the world to me, and I'd love to connect with you. Please follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Sharing Passion and Purpose and Twitter at Passion Sharing. Also, if you like this podcast, it would mean a lot to me for you to subscribe, rate, and review it. And as always, all my show notes will be available on my website, sharingpassionandpurpose.com.